transgender, transgender queer, transsexual. It's a topic that provokes a lot of controversy. Recently, the conversation of transgender students has fueled a heated debate in the Twin Cities over the status of their participation in high school sports. I'm Rene Kaman. Our Issues Twin Cities starts now. After the Minnesota State High School League's hearing, Minnesota now joins 32 other states who already have transgender policies in place for high school student athletes. I think, and it, and it can't be understated, the support of, of students, uh, parents, and community members who came together to support and advocate and really shine a light on a community that's often misunderstood, mm -hmm. uh, marginalized, and, and of, often invisible in conversations. And so it took those people to come together and really share the stories, um, really, really stand with, with our transgender students um, in, in support and show that, that they care um, and that they're a valuable part of not only our, our schools, but also our communities and our society. Um, and, and I think that's what really helped kind of turn the tide. Also, um, I think the leadership on the inside uh, at the Minnesota State High School League mm -hmm. was, was also really valuable. It usually takes, for any systemic change, uh, two groups, right? So the groups on the outside that are advocating for the change, and then also the people on the inside that are willing to help uh, make that change. So I think leadership from the inside mm -hmm. and the advocacy and leadership uh, that we saw from the community, students, and families. Were you surprised that the policy passed? I was really hopeful, mm -hmm. right, that the policy would pass. I tend to remain <laughs> optimistic, mm -hmm. you know, maybe cautiously so, mm -hmm. uh, cautiously optimistic. Uh, and we've seen such tremendous progress in, in, in so many other areas mm -hmm. that I was really hopeful that it would. Um, that did start to get called into question as the vote was tabled mm -hmm. um, back in uh, November or December. Mm -hmm. And once that happened, you know, it was kind of like, okay, you know, yeah. Now we've got this month <laughs> to right. be to be having this conversation, and where is it going to lead us? You know, um, but I was really uh, uh, hopeful and then excited to see that it did pass. What was the reaction of the people in the room once it was passed? Mm -hmm. I think there was a there was a really uh, large sense of pride mm -hmm. uh, that the policy passed. Uh, also, uh, there's that inherent validation uh, that comes with that policy passing. But we also know that there's still room to go. Mm -hmm. uh, in that policy, it doesn't explicitly name uh, transgender male students because mm -hmm. biological uh, females are able to play on male sports. Mm -hmm. And so they're not having that enumerated, okay. um, I think, is, is a piece to grow. It doesn't um, explicitly uh, talk in any way about intersex uh, students and mm -hmm. athletes. Okay. And so there's still room to go in that policy, but then there's also still room to go in the broader um, uh, inclusion uh, in school communities for our transgender students. We know um, that transgender communities uh, experience some of the highest amount of violence, some of the mm -hmm. highest amount of discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's still a lot of other places to advocate. And this is an important step, I think, in the right direction mm -hmm. um, to, to creating that. So the policy will be implemented next year. Mm -hmm. And what it will do is allow students uh, to uh, be on the sports team that best uh, corresponds with their gender identity mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and sense of gender and, and expression. And to get ready for that policy, uh, this year we're going to start um, looking at um, making sure our own policies are, are in line uh, with the revisions, mm -hmm. uh, but also um, begin our trainings um, for our athletic directors um, and, and our school communities mm -hmm. uh, so that by the time it starts next year, we know that we're going to be um, in a good spot and also be able to provide safe spaces uh, for everybody. I think going back um, and acknowledging that transgender people experience a high amount of violence, mm -hmm. how do we make sure that our transgender right. athletes um, are protected and safe uh, in those environments as well? That will really begin with conversations, mm -hmm. and that'll be conversations on uh, the administrative level, mm -hmm. uh, but also conversations uh, with students. And so we'll see uh, those levels of advocacy, but we're also gonna see advocacy from the student body themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think we know that um, students, uh, and, and especially as, as I get to, to interact with this generation of students, mm -hmm. have a really strong sense of social justice, have a really strong sense of inclusion. Mm -hmm. and I think we're going to see some really powerful statements um, from the student body. And oftentimes, uh, in, in work of diversity and inclusion and change making, mm -hmm. it's those young voices that are really helping educate those older voices. Right. And so I think, once again, it'll take both parties. As this hearing on policy change for transgender high school students has drawn many supporters, it has also drawn a strong amount of the impassioned opposition. What do you say to those that are opposed to this policy? 
you know, I, I hope that they will kind of take a step back and understand that we're looking at this from the standpoint of these students. Every student, and what's interesting is that, as far as I know, everybody seems to agree with the concept these students have as much right and, and should be encouraged as much as any other student to take part in, in student uh, school activities, including athletics and other programs that the high school league runs. What I find our opponents saying more is, well, that, yeah, that's fine, provided that they aren't actually appearing to be transgender, provided that we don't pay any attention to the fact that they are transgender, sure they can participate. And our position is no, it, it, it's important to these students, to their mental health, to their physical health, to their sense of self, mm -hmm. to be able to participate in school activities as who they are. What do you think about those that are saying this policy um, is not fair to 99% of those who are not transgender? What do you say? Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess you could say, well, can you give an example of something you're being denied, mm -hmm. the 99%, um, and I'm, I'm not sure that they are. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing I've heard is, well, my kid might end up playing on a team with somebody who's, uh, who seems physically or anatomically to be the person of the other sex. Mm -hmm. The law has allowed that for decades, yeah. so this isn't new. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what it is that is lost and it is, I think, a tactic that we've seen so many times. Uh, if, we, if we do this for those people, oh my gosh, all of us, we will all suffer. And, mm -hmm. and without really a way of articulating what that actually means. Um, in my experience, it's the trans kid who feels most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They're the, the one person in that right. space, in that team or the, the playing field or what have you, mm -hmm. that is kind of is is the focus, mm -hmm. and it, as I recall, <laughs> no kid wants to be the focus. Mm -hmm. no, you know, and and they're the ones who feel most afraid of being uh, harassed, of being attacked, whatever it is. Um, but I have a lot of confidence, frankly, in the students. Um, and what I'm what I'm hearing is a lot of support for saying, yeah, this we get it. This person is transgender. They belong on this team do it. And I think a lot of the, the high school students see this as an adult problem, not a kid problem. Coming up on Our Issues Twin Cities, I talk to a transgender woman who shares her courageous journey and a mother of a transgender son. Jacqueline came out as a transgendered woman in the 1990s. It was then she began to live her life. Transgender person, you know, when male would not act how you would expect a male, or in the past people have expected a male to act, or a female to act, different characteristics mm -hmm. than what's come to have been expected for a male or female. Mm -hmm. It's a very broad spectrum and it includes anybody who falls outside of the normal spectrum. And then there are you know, different groups inside of the whole umbrella. You know, when I was real little, I knew there was something different. Um, that was back in the 70s. So in the 70s and 80s, there, w there wasn't too much information around. So I just you know, buried it and figured I would you know, grow out of it. And I just kept going on. When did you come out? Now I came out after I got out of the Navy in 1995. And um, you know, I transitioned the first time in 96. How was that the first time? Well, the first time I was really gung ho, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the be yourself. Most people are their self every day of their life, and then to suddenly present to the world who you really are is a big, wonderful thing for yourself. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the world doesn't always see it that way, and that's where the problems occur. So it can be challenging, but you know, it was wonderful. All in all, it's been great. I just love being myself. I'm settled now. Mm -hmm. It's over. I'm who I am. This is who I am. And um, you really, you know, it's not like you change, you just let people see who you really are. Mm. And that's, you know, makes your relationships better. Mm -hmm. um, what have been the challenges for you as you transition then over the years? Well, the challenges, you know, a lot of people don't understand transgender, mm -hmm. so they're afraid of it. So, you know, they, they fight it. And, you know, they kind of just block you out. Mm -hmm. Has the community been supportive? Have your family and immediate family been supportive? Yeah, my, my family is supportive, my immediate family is supportive. Um, the community? 
community. Minnesota is a very supportive state, mm -hmm. probably one of the more supportive states mm -hmm. out of all 50. And um, I mean, there was a big difference between 96 and now it's gotten much better. So over time, more and more people are understanding that we're just people, we're just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. What have been the rewards for you? Well, you just meet so many wonderful people, transgendered and not, and it's, it's, it's great. And, it's, and then you help other people, you know, when you're first starting out, you're struggling. And you help other people, and that's nice too, because be there for them. How important is the issue of transgender student high school athletes here in the state of Minnesota? Well, it, it's a big step for these kids because you know they're trying to be themselves, and how can they if they can't compete as themselves? Mm -hmm. So, so for them, it's huge, and it also helps other kids learn to understand and accept them for who they are. Allison, a mother of two holds this policy near and dear to her heart. Her 11-year-old son is transgender. He's the bravest kid I know. Uh, he came out to his entire school when he was in fifth grade. Uh, very, you know, nonchalantly, I was worried he wasn't. And that's the nature of, of this issue is that adults seem to get all worked up and the kids are like, whatever, no big deal. And he said in front of his entire class, you've all known me as, and he gave his birth name, but in my head and in my heart, I'm a boy. I'd appreciate it if you'd call me George from now on. That was it. It was amazing. And uh, they were comfortable, and they do. And he's accepted at his school for who he is. And it's, you know, it's not a big deal. I understand he testified at the board meeting yeah, last week. How was that? Well, I was nervous because I knew that there were going to be people that didn't want to hear what he had to say in the room, and I, I was scared for him, he wasn't scared at all. And uh, he had written his testimony out the night before and he just read it and I was so proud because he was really, really strong. And he was reading about how it's just, he's just a regular kid and there are hate signs around him. He didn't care. He was gonna say what he had to say. And uh, you know, I think it takes a lot of integrity for for someone to be able to do that and a lot of bravery much braver than someone who hides behind a t an attack ad against a young person you know the, the the child protection league is such a funny name for this group because they're attacking children and that's not what a protection league i think should do and then these brave children stand up and just talk matter-of-factly about themselves despite the fact that there are these people who are intend to marginalize them right. you must have been a proud mama of him I definitely was. I was terrified and then I was proud. Yeah. I was terrified because I just didn't know how people would react and then I was proud when he was so strong and I remember giving him a hug and he's like, Mom, everyone's giving me hugs. Why is this such a big deal? Well, what was uh, his reaction when the policy was passed? Of course he was so happy and he talked a lot about how this really wasn't about being on the athletic field. It was about all these things that, all, all of the different ways that transgender youth are set aside or, or told no you can't, that this is a, was an affirming yes you can play and that he wanted to keep working towards getting equality in all the other different ways that transgender people are working towards. So I think we have a little activist on our hands. So what does the future look like for transgender high school athletes and other transgender people? I think the, it's going to be a fight. I've already heard that the uh, newly controlled Minnesota legislature, uh, controlled by the GOP, wants to take this up as an issue. And you know they can, they can do that if they want to do that. And we can still talk and, and ex try to explain to people that transgender individuals are just like you and me. Um, we can do that. But I, despite that, I do think that eventually, the more we talk about transgender individuals, the more we show transgender individuals just as regular people, that the future will be better and better and better. And bright. I hope, yes, and bright. Up next on our Issues Twin Cities. We've been fortunate um, to be in that position, but it's important for us not to take that for granted either. What this new policy means for the future of transgender people in Minnesota.
regardless of their gender-related identity. Today, all students can participate in athletic activities based on a team of their gender choice. Because of this new policy, the future of Minnesota continues to progress. You know, I think it's important to a lot of people. I take a step back and I say it's what's important to Out Front Minnesota is the issue of transgender youth throughout Minnesota. Um, in 2014, I can just tell you from my perspective, from the work I do here at Out Front, we have seen a tremendous increase in the number of inquiries from parents of young transgender kids, some as young as elementary school age, who are working to try to get access to health care, to correct identity documents, who have experienced problems at schools or campgrounds. Um, and so against that backdrop, it's not surprising that an issue has arisen around the question of transgender athletes in, in high schools. And if, if our experience with these young kids and their families coming forward with these issues is indicative, uh, there will be more transgender high school students uh, and athletes in the future and so to the extent that the high school league is trying to take a position and try to plan for that, uh, we think it's absolutely the right thing to do and it is an important step to take. You know, and, and we've, seen, we've seen tremendous support too and once again, um, there's really been an increase uh, that I've seen in family advocacy mm -hmm. um, and that's played such an important role oh, yeah. in, in, in changing uh, school culture um, mm -hmm. a, a changing, I think, uh, the larger culture as mm -hmm. a whole as well. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a relationship between uh, the teachers, mm -hmm. the administrators, the parents, and the student, and we can all sit down and have a conversation, mm -hmm. the process moves very easily, mm -hmm. and, and often in a very safe way. Right. Um, because we have a relationship mm -hmm. um, as kind of the, the center of all that. One of our staff people has been involved for much of this year in trying to sort of advise uh, not in a legal sense, but just to kind of provide input to the high school league as they've developed their draft. And then, of course, when the publicity hit more uh, in August, September, and this became a front page uh, kind of story, then we were um, engaging a lot of the members in the LGBT community, talking to them about this issue, talking to them about how important it is to speak out, to, to show support for the students and their families, and to, to move the league towards um, towards finalizing a policy. But having this, this conversation has been very important for this community uh, and for the general community as well. The, the policy is really quite simple. It simply focuses on, on one question, and that is which team will this student be assigned to play on? Um, and if a person provides sufficient medical documentation from their, from their provider, from their physician, that says, yeah, this person does experience gender dysphoria. I am treating them for this. They have received appropriate clinical treatment, and it is appropriate in the context of that treatment that they play for this particular team over here. Um, our hope, and with the support of the parents, our hope then is that it would be the rare school district that would say, well, we're going to ignore this medical situation and the, the needs that the student has and, and force them to play on, on this other team and force them to identify in a way that's not appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. um, although there's been a lot of attention and a lot of excitement around things like locker rooms and so on, the draft policy says not a word about locker rooms. Um, what the high school league recognizes, I think, is that those are important questions and they need to be addressed by the participating school. We've had, a, we've had high success rates uh, in creating uh, trans-inclusive restroom options mm -hmm. uh, in our schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been uh, allowing transgender students to um, choose the restrooms that best okay. correspond with their gender identity, um, as well as providing gender-neutral bathroom mm -hmm. options for all students. Mm -hmm. And that's been working. And that's been working, and we've seen that from uh, first grade all the way through twelfth oh, grade. Oh, okay. Yep, oh, yep. And gender—I mean, gender is one of those things, right? That mm -hmm. when we think about it, uh, one of the first things uh, that we acknowledge as young mm -hmm. people—and I'm talking like four years old—is mm -hmm. uh, is gender. If yeah. uh, for people with um, uh, young children, if you think about. Uh, let's say you've got a, a, a young boy mm -hmm. and they're playing dress up and they're wearing pink and they're mm -hmm. doing all these things and then one day they come home from school and they go I don't want to do that that's a girl's color mm -hmm. right and so what's that message right mm -hmm. that we're that 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 children are, are receiving at a, at a very young age mm -hmm. um, but then also uh, the the policing that we do in ourselves um, so we, we see uh, gender nonconforming and transgender children mm -hmm. um, starting to uh, ex express that um, within kindergarten and first grade even. Yeah. We're talking about a very small number of students overall, but there are students who are all over the state. One of the, the clients we worked with was a family um, in, in southern Minnesota in an extremely small community where this teenager had been adopted from another state and they needed to get 
uh, a court order for, for corrected identity documents. This is a kid who's growing up in a, probably a fairly isolated area. Um, whether you're talking about one kid or 10 or 100 or 1,000, the fact the high school league has laid down a suggested uh, policy and approach for saying here's how you should navigate this question, uh, that's terrific. It provides some guidance if a school has one person or 10 that that, that would apply to. It helps the school and it helps the family and the student. Minneapolis, for example, was the first city in the United States to provide for uh, a city ordinance that pro prohibited discrimination against transgender people. This is back in the mid-1970s. Minnesota was the first state to do so uh, through the Minnesota Human Rights Act, and this was in 1993. Um, it's been mentioned that one of the premier organizations uh, that serves transgender people called the uh, World Professional Association for Transgender Health is hosted here at the University of Minnesota and their program in human sexuality is internationally recognized as a leader in providing health care to transgender people. So I think for a number of reasons, um, Minnesota and the Twin Cities have been recognized as a very uh, supportive community for trans people and I think a lot of folks feel very much at home and supported here. There's always still room to, to go mm -hmm. um, but once again when we see that support from the community and the parents and we see that support from the administration it makes that path easier. Mm -hmm. So we've been fortunate um, to be in that position mm -hmm. and once again I, I also want to emphasize that there's still room to go mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it's important for us not to take that for granted either. Right. Historically we've been um, fortunate to be uh, a a leader in that um, and so this is once again uh, a continuing step down that road um, and I'm really glad to see Minnesota take that stance. The new policy for transgender student high school athletes will take effect in the 2015-2016 school year. Thank you for joining me this week on Our Issues Twin Cities. I'm Renika Kaman. See you next time.